Spectrum News One presents LA Times The Envelope Roundtable, brought to you by the Apple TV Plus drama series, The Mosquito Coast, for your Emmy consideration in all eligible categories. This is the Los Angeles Times series, The Envelope Roundtable, drama. Our discussions with the most creative talents in entertainment. In the fourth season of Netflix's The Crown, Emma Corrin plays the late Princess Diana, struggling with the royal family and her marriage to Prince Charles. See, you're going to bring a deep and lasting joy to the nation. And if I may say, you both look very much in love. Oh, yes, absolutely. In his portrayal of Dr. Jonathan Frazier in HBO's miniseries The Undoing, Hugh Grant's trademark charm is on display, but there are disturbing layers not far beneath Jonathan's surface. I mean, could, could he have gone there that night for some reason and seen me with her? And I know. Are you actually Wait. asking me, do I think our son beat a woman to death? Ethan Hawke brings to life John Brown, the driven abolitionist whose actions helped spark the American Civil War in Showtime's The Good Lord Bird. My name is Captain John! Redeemer! Anthony Mackie brings Avenger Sam Wilson to television in Disney Plus's The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, in which superheroes face real-world problems such as PTSD and racism in America. Why'd you give up that shield? I did what I thought was right. Elizabeth Moss continues her acclaimed portrayal of June Osborne, a woman torn from her family and held captive in a new society who is ready to fight back in the fourth season of Hulu's The Handmaid's Tale. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? And in HBO's Lovecraft Country, Journey Smollett plays Letitia Lewis, a woman in 1950 Chicago contending with racist mobs and cops and other monsters. That's haunting us and testing us. That's like the devil. Hi, I'm Michael Ordonia. I cover film and television for the Los Angeles Times. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. There they are. Hello, everybody. Hello. Oh, what's up, man? Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. I'd like to start with you, Hugh, because of the very long film resume you had before any of this started. I heard an interview with you where you refused to call the undoing television. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's true that TV used to be thought of as the impoverished cousin to film, but does it still have that, that feeling for you? Uh, only for me. Everyone else <laughs> has moved on. <laughs> So what uh, lured you into The Undoing then? Why did you agree to do that many hours of TV? It seemed like a very classy project. I don't get off with that many classy projects. And it was Susanna Beer, very distinguished Danish director. It was uh, David Kelly, who is kind of king of television in, in America, apparently. And Nicole, with all her Oscars. The whole world thinks I did this. My only chance is for people who know me to come forward. To help you? You actually think I'm gonna help you? You know my heart. You know my heart. I, I understand that you can no longer trust me to be the man you thought I was. I get that. But you certainly know that I would never take a human life. So I felt I couldn't possibly say no, although I did try, because I hate working. Uh, I, I tried to find a reason not to do it, but I, I couldn't in the end. It was, it was, too, it was too good. I, I don't know if this is what you meant to you about not calling it television, but I felt very much like The Good Lord Bird was just a six, six seven hour movie. And when I was a kid, there was cinema and there was movie, uh, television and television kind of just entertained you for as long as they could. You know, they would just, it didn't, the stories didn't have a beginning, middle and an end. They didn't have a theme. They didn't have a thesis. They didn't have metaphor. And they were generally uh, a smaller budget. And now, we had a, one of the hugest budgets I, I'd had in years of working on The Good Lord Bird. That was exciting to me to work on a much bigger canvas and to have more 
time with the character, but to not feel like I was pouring water in my beer, you know? I, I felt like we had a real clear story to tell. Did you go mingle with anyone in a fleshly way without being married? No, sir. You didn't? No, sir. You promise? I am still as clean and pure as the day I was born in that day. Your soul is more precious than your life. You know that, right? You know that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Salmon! There's a political atmosphere to our show, and I think that had Showtime foreseen how volatile this year would be, they might not have made the show. Um, we, we kind of got in, you know, I, 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 don't, I never understand why people greenlight what they do and why they don't. I, 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 don't, I, have, a, I don't have my finger on the pulse of America. I, I have it on the heel. You know, I can't find a heartbeat. <laughs> Handmaid's Tale, Elizabeth, you're a, a producer on it now and a director now, by the way. It clearly has some real world resonance for us. I wonder if that's one of those shows though that a few years ago would have been hard to get made because of its content. Oh, I think it was definitely helped by the era of streaming because it's it can be a pretty tough show to watch. And I think um, without the sort of, you know, with the limitations of network television, obviously we wouldn't have been able to, to make it. Because I'm your mom. I'm your mother. It is my job to protect you. But I kind of echo what Ethan said, where I, I don't quite understand, um, even as a producer, what, you know, why things get greenlit and why some things don't, uh, why some things hit and why some things don't. Um, I do think that our show in 2016 obviously came along at a time that people were really looking at certain things that were paralleled on our show. But I, I do think for sure that, uh, you know, all of the programs that all of us are on are, are made possible by being able to tell those stories as creatively and as bravely as we can, which, which streaming does in HBO and all of those and cable does allow us to do. Journey, you've said before that you're a big fan of horror, but uh, you've also complained, I think quite rightly, that it isn't really the province of black women or hasn't been. How did you feel about finally getting a chance to play a, a substantial role in a, a horror series that tells the stories from a black perspective? I'm not the only one who um, feels like as a black artist, you can be a fan of horror, but horror hasn't always been a fan of us. Hmm. Um, one of these scripts, I told that there was a time in which I just told my agents, do not send me a horror film because I know I'm just going to be the black chick that dies on page 37 and I don't want to do that. Um, and so with Lovecraft Country, it was so exciting for me to be a part of a, a narrative, a counter narrative to such a dominant narrative. <laughs> normalizing our stories in such a way, our story unfolds in a very classical design. You know, our heroes go on a quest to restore order and balance to their land. Um, but because we are characters that sit at the intersection of multiple identities, my character Letty is a black woman in 1955 Jim Crow America. You know, it's, it's a different, layer of a quest that she's gonna go on, you know? How can she really restore order to a place where you could ask the question, was there ever order to begin with in Jim Crow America or in America now, you know? Um, and so it, it's, it was so fascinating to be able to jump into a character that has such a very classical archetype, you know? She's the, essentially the virgin goddess, you know? Um, when you layer in all of the socio-political economic and historical context of being a black woman in Jim Crow America, it's just such rich, uh, such a rich playground for you as an artist to, to be able to play in. Anthony, in your show, Sam Wilson is a world famous Avenger, but he still gets racially profiled by cops. He can't get a bank loan. And there's a, a, a very important subplot that has resonances with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Uh, these are some pretty hardcore racial issues that are, are handled in a very bare knuckles fashion by your show, but this is the most successful media franchise ever in the MCU. So were you 
uh, jumping at the chance to to put that realism in an MCU property? You know, the relationship between black men in America is one of abuse, betrayal, uh, disheartened love, and no um, no appreciation. And you know, the thing with Sam Wilson that I loved so much and that I was so excited about with this series is, you know, it's not so much, it's him having to come to grips with the abusive relationship that he has with the country that he lives in and then having to stand up and fight for that country. That was something that me as a black man with my four black sons, with my black dad and my two black brothers, mm. we've always had that conversation. It feels like it belongs to someone else. That show represents a lot of things to a lot of people. It made sense to me. It was a conversation that um, Malcolm and I had because uh, I have two uncles who are vets. And um, I've had that conversation with them. And um, friends and vets who have come back from war and the way they were treated. You know, luckily for me, early in my career, which I didn't even realize, early in my career, you know, I lived in Harlem. And there are a lot of, when the black soldiers came back from Vietnam, when they came back from Korea, when they came back from World War II, a lot of them weren't offered homes, they weren't offered opportunities, they weren't, they weren't given a warm welcome. So they stayed in specific neighborhoods that were geared towards them. And one of those uh, neighborhoods was Harlem. And uh, I had several uh, uh, neighbors who were vets and having that conversation with them and learning about what it was like when they came home uh, was astonishing and uh, disheartening. Sam's journey in the show has to, uh, had to deal with and acknowledge all of that, come to grips with it, and accept the apology that he got from Bucky that America has never given any black man who's ever been here. Emma, you're playing Princess Diana, whom many of us remember very vividly, and I think a lot of people hold dear to their hearts. So is the fact that she's so well-known, people have such strong feelings about her, both a burden and an advantage? I mean, exactly that, that there was this huge sort of tidal wave of responsibility and also just so much out there, so much in terms of research to do and so many, I mean, you can just type her name into Google these days and there are still news articles. People just have this endless fascination. But not only that, but also so much feeling towards her. So I sort of struggled for the first part of um, sort of the research process, I suppose, to get beyond that and figure out how I was going to actually make this person who felt so unapproachable in scale, in her scale, someone who I could go in and like actually play and inhabit in some way um and really what changed it for me was like breaking it down to like actually to be honest getting the scripts and reading what peter had written and sort of forgetting everything else and actually just sort of coming to it as a character on a page and forgetting everything else i don't deserve this this is supposed to be my tour my tour as Prince of Wales to shore up one of the key countries in the Commonwealth at a very delicate moment politically, and thanks to you... Thanks to me, people have shown up. Thanks to me, people are interested. No, thanks to you, people are laughing in my face. Booing the heir to the throne, booing the crown. Oh, come on! Oh, don't do this! Please! I think also that's something that people are weirdly love about the crown, is that it turns these people who feel very removed from our everyday life into human people with human stories. And at the end of the day, what Josh and I were doing was exploring the nuances and complexities in, a, in two people's marriage. They happen to be in extraordinary circumstances and people we know, but when they're, they're yelling at each other, really what they're feeling, we have all felt at some point or will do. And Emma, I, I'm curious, though, about the reception to the crown in Britain, because uh, in, in America, of course, we sort of expect material about our leaders to be highly critical. Well, to some of us, it's treason. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, 
I adore The Crown. I did think this last one was probably the most controversial. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Emma? I mean, it, 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 it is. I think so. I think it's just the closer you get to people's... Yeah, the closer you get to the present day, the more controversial it's going to be, I guess. I think that'll, that's just the way it will be, yeah. I have a question for you. OK. So I, I, I genuinely adored it. I hope you can tell from my tone. And you were sensational. But Thank I... You. And I know Pete Morgan, I used to play golf with him. He's a very bad-tempered golfer. <laughs> But I thought, uh, when you go to Balmoral and they're all horrible to you, mm. I just thought, that was the first time ever in the series, I thought, I don't, I don't think they would have been that horrible. They wouldn't have been that Wait. rude. Do you mean when I walk in and it's the shot where I'm in standing in the circle? Sorry. Uh, uh, this one next. <laughs> sir, Your Royal Highness, if it's the first greeting, right. then, sir. Now, me. Yeah, particularly that scene. And, and they won't help you to... Who, who do you bow to first and then Princess Margaret's horrible to you and all that. Yeah. Is that, is that all accurate? Or I, I felt they just would have... just They would have been too English to be that nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was accurate. I honestly... I'm not sure. I know that there are certain things that the Crown, the research team, know happened, and I think... Peter elaborates on it for the purposes of the story. So I think that what he wanted to get out of that scene was that Diana walked in expecting a family and what she got was the firm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was that yeah, kind I get of thing. Yeah. But I thought I think... all the way through the, the series, all the seasons that he, he basically liked them. And then suddenly I thought, oh, Christ, he hates these people. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I well, think he... I don't know. I think he does. I think he's endlessly fascinated by them. Yeah. I think he has to be to keep writing. If, <laughs> if I may say, I've had a lot of British people be absolutely nasty and horrible to me, Hugh, so I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but you deserve it, Ian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we do hate you. <laughs> I, I'm sure you, you earned it somehow. Uh, yeah. But... Ethan, uh, you have a very, very different challenge in playing a historical figure and playing John Brown. I mean, for better or worse, Emma has a ton of video evidence of what this person walked like and talked like, and she was endlessly analyzed. John Brown is somebody I think most Americans have heard of but don't know that much about. So, uh, you know, I, I'm curious about how you came across that characterization of him. You did some very distinctive things. You made some strong choices. I wonder if maybe you, you read his speeches aloud and found the voice or something. How did you come up with that? First of all, I felt I wasn't playing John Brown as he was. I, I was playing John Brown as imagined by James McBride. Yeah. And it's, you know, our, our narrators, this young kid, Henry Shackelford, and he's kind of like Huck Finn or something. He's an unreliable narrator. And so he's, he's telling you the John Brown he knows. And I remember when I was a kid, everybody that I met who was extremely religious or extremely political, I always felt like they were yelling at me. I just remember, you know, my, my grandfather saying to me, you know, what do you think about Jimmy Carter? You know, and, and uh, <laughs> it, 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 uh, always, anytime they talked about God or politics, I just was afraid of them. So I, I had this idea that maybe Onion would perceive me as yelling at him all the time. And I, I started thinking about my grandfather and he used to, you know, he was at, in declamation, you know, he would do these debating things and he would memorize big speeches and he would practice them from the top of a pecan tree. And he had this habit of just speaking in full paragraphs and shouting at everybody he met. And so I just kind of ran with that idea and tried to base it off of something personal. I mean, I do it. It's so challenging when people have a, a strong hit on who they think your character is. And I was very liberated. Nobody, you know, there's no recordings of John Brown talking. I don't know. We're, there's a few photographs, but that's all. And I hereby order you to get, get in his holy name, get, for he is on the side of justice and you are on the side of chains. Hugh, uh, Jonathan's state of mind or who he, who he really is, is one of the key 
pillars of, of the undoing. And, you know, uh, you've talked before about your extensive character biographies. But I wonder, did you did you seek out a, a professional opinion of of what he is? Is he a is he a psychopath? Is he a narcissist? Did you think about that? I did Google all that stuff about uh, the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath and a narcissistic sociopath. I can't remember any of it now. <laughs> I think uh, I think it was quite useful, but it's all a bit dry. Mm -hmm. And in the end, a bit like Ethan basing his character on his grandfather, it, it, it's. I find it more useful to find real people that one knows mm. and use them mm -hmm. as models rather than some academic model. Uh, so, you know, I was lucky to have Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and um, <laughs> uh, narcissistic sociopaths in, in, on my TV screen. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that you marked your script with both innocent Jonathan moments and guilty Jonathan moments. Did you have different defining moments for those two sides of him? Well, I think he would have a, a tough time answering your question because 99.9% um, .9 of the, the series is innocent Jonathan, mm -hmm. who of course is a lie, but it's a lie that he absolutely believed in the way that real sociopaths, they, they do believe their own lies is they're not lies i mean i think he really thinks he's innocent it's mm -hmm. it, for him it's impossible that he could have committed this appalling act uh but of course so every moment's real for him there and, and revealing because it's not my legacy my legacy is you and my patience and your mum yeah you murdered a person dad the truth of the matter is the real Jonathan, the guilty Jonathan, is, is only exposed once in a scene that actually was never in the script. It was put, put in by, uh, slightly with me having a little tantrum, and uh, Susanna Beer, who directed it, uh, agreeing with me, because uh, I felt it wasn't really clear in the scripted version of episode six, the first one we got, who really had done it. And I thought, is this just them leaving the door open for a subsequent series. And <laughs> I, I'd really signed up on the basis of being a, a killer. I wanted to kill. And um, so I was cross. So then Susanna said, well, we'll shoot the murder and then, then there won't be any debate about it. <laughs> so in that scene, um, the beast, Jonathan, who comes round and mm. has sex with that poor girl, that poor actress, Christ, a quarter of my age and awful for her. And then, and then I, smash her against the wall and then and then I kill her. And that that is the that is the real obviously that's the only real job. I don't know how they found me, but we need to go. What do you think he did? We're gonna get somewhere safe. And we start again. Why are you doing this to him? Why is he doing this to you? We really get in trouble. The kids could get hurt. This is going to be an adventure. That's what I'm worried about. Elizabeth, you're, of course, not only the star of Handmaid's Tale, but you're one of the producers, and yeah, as we said before, you're one of the directors now. I, I wonder about that arc that she's been on for the, these four years, the, you know, the first season being the book when we even see her before Gilead and how she was traumatized and developed into what is now uh, an active freedom fighter. Was that arc planned from the beginning? I think the broad strokes were there uh, as ideas, but obviously the details weren't. Um, she's changed so much over the years, I feel. I, ho I hope other people feel that way. Uh, you know, I had the book in the beginning, um, which was this like incredible inner monologue because it's all first person narrative. And then we were sort of sent out on our own in season two and had to kind of develop it ourselves from there. I think the thing for me that I think is really interesting is we kind of have gone through the freedom fighter phase and are still sort of in it, but what we're really talking about now and with the characters, what I'm really exploring with the character is what it's like when you are completely changed by a prison, by a system, and you'll never be the same again. Do you know 
why God made you pregnant. So that when he kills that baby inside your womb, you will feel a fraction of the pain that you caused us when you tore our children from our arms. Do you understand me? So she can never go back to who she was before Gilead, before she got there. And she she is now somebody that is completely different. And she has lost so many people. She has experienced so much trauma. She has killed so many people that she can just never be the same. So yes, she's a freedom fighter, but I think what we're also exploring is, is kind of what it takes to actually be that person and actually be that leader and how you have to really let go of a of a huge part of yourself and become something that is not pretty and not uh and not soft and and not emotional sometimes um so i i feel like you know like we were talking about earlier one of the great things about television i, I grew up in television um and on tv shows and what i've loved about it for so many years is being able to play a character for six seven years and really develop them and take them over this gigantic journey as as you change yourself, you know? Uh, so yeah, I feel like, um, I feel like she has definitely become a person that is very different from, from where we started. Yeah. It's, uh, interesting. You, you mentioned that sort of the ugly parts of herself that she's going to have to embrace to, to become a, a, a freedom fighter or a leader. Um, it's such a, a, a contrast between your June and Ethan's John Brown, because uh, Ethan's John Brown, as he said, is not afraid of death, but he's also okay with his sons dying for the cause. And and June has a very different view of that. She she uh, gives up her comrades when her her daughter's in danger, right? Yeah, but I mean, it's her daughter. You know, what is she going to do? That's it. I mean, that's the end of it. It's her, um, as any parent knows, or as any person who understands that kind of love, even if you're not a parent, you know that that is the ultimate love and, mm. and you will do anything for that person, for that child or that person that you're taking care of. And so that's what ultimately breaks June in, in that episode three is that nothing matters more to her than her daughter. Mm -hmm. Journey, uh, I, I wondered what, what you would use as the basis for Letty. And uh, I think I, I heard you say that you thought of your grandmother did you, your grandmother influence that portrayal? How so? Yeah, my grandmother, um, she was nicknamed Showtime because she could show you a good time. <laughs> but she was the first black Miss Galveston, um, Galveston, Texas, a beauty queen, an extraordinarily intelligent woman, and a single mom who raised four black children in the 1950s. And, you know, growing up, I didn't get to meet my grandmother. She passed away before... Um, my mom was pregnant with my oldest brother, but I would always hear stories about her. And my mom would talk about, you know, the dignity that my grandmother had, this real indomitable spirit, this inability to allow the world to um, tell her that she was less than, than who she was. She was a beauty queen, but she cleaned the homes of white folks. And every single day she would go to work with her hair done and her lipstick on and her dress pressed and clean their toilets. And mm -hmm. it didn't matter how, you know, how much they disrespected her or underpaid her or tried to rob her of her dignity. She wouldn't give them that power over her. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that so much in my approach to Letty. <laughs> Letty's rich with so many contradictions. You know, she is a drifter who needs, who habitually abandons her family and yet is in search of family. Um, she can't afford to buy a pair of stockings when we meet her, and yet she has dreams of buying a house in an all-white neighborhood. She didn't go to her mother's funeral. She's a woman, like, trying to navigate her womanhood when she was never even allowed to have a girlhood. And so I thought a lot about my grandmother and women in the 1950s who had to 
fight the patriarchy and white supremacy, you know, at the same time? Um, and how did they do that and still hold on to their dignity? How did they not give the world that power over them? Um, and, and with Letty, it was, it was constantly trying to find that balance because outwardly she's one way and internally she's really having like a, an internal crisis. Um, and so, yeah, I thought about my grandmother quite often and women like Gwendolyn Brooks and Lorraine Hansberry, um, these women in the 1950s, I mean, I stand on their shoulders, you know, I'm, I'm here as a result of, of, their, of their strength, of their audacity to just be themselves unapologetically. I wanted to ask you guys about reactions to your, your shows that have, have been meaningful to you. And uh, Anthony, in, in the case of your show and your character, th there's a, an added symbolic value to it, I think. When I think about kids seeing a Marvel show and Captain America's Black, I think that that's, uh, that's profound, I, I think. So have you had reactions to the show that, that were meaningful to you? Uh, the reactions have been amazing. They've been huge, uh, you know, but it's been the same reactions when little girls, you know, watch Wonder Woman or when you're watching Black Panther and there's an army of black women. Like when you, you know, it, it, the, the idea of representation, the idea of recontextualizing what you think the norm is, is always important. Sharon, Bucky, what's going on on your end? Nothing, all quiet. I'm sorry, wait, who are I'm you? Captain America. And that's why I love doing these movies because, you know, when we, when we were developing the script and I found out we were gonna have the Doras in my show, I was like, yes, so I get to pick my Doras. Yeah. And, you know, when they came in, they're always, like, they're so uh, astute and profound and so beautiful at the same time. And they completely destroy every myth and idea of what you think a black woman should be in a superhero costume, in a superhero movie, doing superhero And I love that because every time the Doras come on, my boys are like, those chicks are bad, you know? And my 11-year-old goes, dad, those ladies are bad ass. And I'm like, hell yeah, they are, you know? So the, the, the idea of that, the identity of that, them growing up with that, it changes everything. I'd like to ask all of you about moments that you felt defined your characters in these seasons of your shows. Um, you know, something that really revealed what, the way you think of this person. And Emma, I'd, I'd like to start with you. I, I think of that moment where you're dancing by yourself as Diana, as kind of peeling back a curtain and showing us this the spirit of this person that we had only imagined because we never saw publicly. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of spot on, to be honest. Um, it was that episode, episode three for me, fairy tale, which is basically just you experience Diana's intense isolation mm -hmm. and you come very close, I think, to just seeing her in all these different situations. You can kind of sense what's going through her mind. And it was a wonderful gift as an actor to have that time with your character. I mean, shooting that episode, I was more or less alone for most of it. Mm. and. Yeah, it really was just me experiencing what it'd be like to, yeah, be lonely or isolated in that way. But that dancing scene was, for me as Emma, just like such a joy to do. I remember the day before we were filming some like a ballet lesson she had to do and I remember Ben Karen, the director, saying, oh, we've got a choreographer who will choreograph something for the dance scene tomorrow where you lose yourself. And I remember saying, I mean, I'm not a dancer at all. In fact, like, notoriously bad. Um, <laughs> but I remember that um, I just had this weird gut instinct and I was like, do you mind if we don't choreograph it? I said, like, I'd really just like to feel it and it's okay also if I pick the music. Um, and Ben was like, um, yes. He was like, I mean, we won't be able to use the music you choose. And I was like, no, 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 just to dance to. I just want to, like, pick a song and then just, like, feel it. And, um, yeah, so I came in the next day, and I don't think anyone was... Everyone was quite, like, nervous about what I was about to do. And, um, yeah, and I danced to Cher, Do You Believe? Mm -hmm. And 
they just put it on and they set up one camera and I just like danced for three minutes and it was euphoric and it I just it was incredible I just loved it and I think for me that got to the crux of like Diana it got to the crux of her the child within her who just needed to be seen and to be held I think that's really all she wanted this like the entire time and it got her spirit of this energy she had that was infectious and I think people felt that and this kind of like yeah this spirit that you couldn't dampen and I think that was all encapsulated in that moment and yeah so I think to be honest you got you hit the nail on the head it was that journey how about you was there uh, uh was there something in Lovecraft Country where you felt like this is the real Letty uh, all the other stuff stripped away you know her 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 needs for material comfort gone and her fear of the unknown gone this is who she is yeah there's a moment in episode eight um that comes to mind um in which she is on her knees in a church praying and um so much has happened to her by then she's gone through absolute change and um there She's just in a church praying. It's after Emmett Till's funeral. Emmett Till has been killed, um, who he was a family friend in, in her life. Um, and it impacts her on a level that she can't really describe while simultaneously she's reckoning with this newfound power in knowing magic hmm. and knowing what magic can do. And she is praying to God because it's clear that she's in a spiritual warfare because she really only has God on her side. You know, she has these real conflicting beliefs about magic and actually feels like it's doing more harm than good now that they're aware of it. No. God, the man that I love. I'm begging you, God. I'm begging you, please, God, please. And she's praying for the man that she loves. And in that moment, Christina, who's kind of, not kind of, who is our villain, comes in and Letty asks her to cast a spell on the man she loves to make him invulnerable so that Atticus won't die. And she says no. Christina says no to Letty. She says, but I'll do it for you. And for me, true character is always, is always revealed when you're forced to make a choice under pressure. Yeah. Anything we say and do when there's no pressure and you don't have to make an actual choice, it's kind of like, well, is that her? And she makes the choice to accept it. And she takes the invulnerability. Mm -hmm. And to me, it reveals so much about Letty and her eyes, the way she sees the world in that scene she's struggling with so much. She's struggling with these forces that feel beyond her. She's struggling with the loss. She's struggling with the, this real collective grief. And she's also struggling with how to best protect people that she loves, or does she pr protect herself? Um, and she's always kind of struggled, has that inner struggle of self versus community, self versus family. Um, and she ends up taking it which revealed a lot about her. John Brown, what, what a dude. Can you tell me uh, about a key moment for him that you think when you were making it, and especially because you had a hand in writing it, where you said, this is the thing that, that I want to get across about him? Well, I don't, there's so many. I love playing this character so much. I, I, I could talk about it forever, but I'm, I, my brain keeps thinking about something that Elizabeth said about, you know, the, the love that one has for their children and how it, 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 it's more than ideology, it's more, more than anything. And one of the fascinating things about John Brown is that while everything you said is true, Elizabeth, for a normal person, <laughs> where the insight into John Brown comes is that he was really proud of his boys for dying. I was reading these letters and, you know, people would say, how could you do that? You're crazy, you, you got your sons killed. And he said, you know, someday America is going to be ashamed of slavery and they'll never be ashamed of my sons. It's how far he saw his mission that he was willing to lose his own children. 
Um, and that is a place where it's, it's almost hard for your brain to, you know, he's really, really proud of them for dying for the cause. And it's like, he has a line where he says, uh, it's in the novel and it's one of my, fa it's like reasons to make the show to me is, is, uh, there's an eternity ahead of us and there's an eternity behind and this one little speck in the middle, that's our life. And, you know, he's, he's just charged to live that, mm. that, that speck to the fullest. Anthony, um, how about you in, in Falcon Winter Soldier? Is there a defining moment for Sam? There's a moment with Sam and uh, Bucky where they're out practicing throwing the shield and they have a conversation about who Sam is, who Bucky is, what the shield means to both of them. That shield represents a lot of things to a lot of people. And Bucky takes a moment and he apologizes mm -hmm. for not understanding or even considering what it would mean to Sam. And I think that moment, more than anything I say or do in the series, is what's the most defining moment for Sam because that's all he wanted was someone to stop and consider what the shield meant to him as a black man in America. It was a very different meaning, a very different representation. And um, at that moment, Bucky took that moment, and that's what gave Sam the, the identity of, of being able to accept everything that he had been through and move forward. So I, 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 I loved the way Malcolm wrote that scene and gave us um, the freedom to just sometimes not say anything, but just to react <laughs> to the other characters' words. I want to ask all of you about inspiration, um, especially since we've all been watching so much television over the pandemic. Whose work right now is exciting you? Uh, does, did you see somebody's work and go, I want to do something that good? That, that person's killing it. Uh, let's start with you, Hugh. Is there, did you see something over the pandemic that really fired you up? I watch an awful lot of cartoons with my children. I, I'm very old, very young children. <laughs> And I'm, I am blown away by them. I was watching um, <laughs> Despicable Me today. I don't think there can be a better film in the world <laughs> than Despicable Me. Very true. Very moving, incredible cinema. A weak answer, I, I, I grant you. Uh, Elizabeth, let's uh, turn to you. Who's, especially now that you're directing, who's inspiring you right now? I'm taking everyone on this off the table because I can't believe I'm getting to look at all your faces. It's all such incredible work over the years. And I was going to say Shira Haas, who was a uh, star in or Unorthodox. I just thought she was just, she blew my mind. I watched that early in the shutdown and I just was like, oh my God. First of all, I got to get better because this one's coming up behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was, I, I just, I, I couldn't believe though, just that complete, absolute raw talent from, from that woman. It's just unbelievable. Emma, <laughs> is there somebody who inspires you, who, whom, whose work you've been watching lately? I think um, Celine Siama's work. I've been watching a lot of her stuff. Um, and I think the way that she depicts queer stories, um, and captures the sort of huge unknowingness of forging an identity um, as um, a queer person in a world that, world that is um, incredibly, for the most part, heteronormative is like really beautiful. I think there's like a sensitivity and um, a real beauty to the work that she does and the story she tells. So yeah, I think She's been, I mean, there are so many, I mean, I can't, I, yeah, but I thought for me this year, that's been, yeah, he, she's been huge for me. How about you, Journey? You were nodding your head during that. I'm such a fan of hers as well. Um, my Kayla, I May Destroy, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I watched it twice because <laughs> after the finale, I mean, it was just so genius to me. I've never seen consent and conversations around consent and sexual assault dealt with such um, um, sensitivity and rawness and boldness and vulnerability. I mean, that finale when she tells an ending in three different ways, mm -hmm. so beautiful and bold to me because it wasn't for us. It wasn't for our satisfaction. It wasn't for the viewer to have a, 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 
uh, an ending that satisfied us. It was an expression of her own trauma. It was so personal. And to lay it out in that way is just, it's just, it was, yeah, it's just an, an incredibly inspiring to me to be able to be that incredibly honest and vulnerable with how you see the world and how you've experienced the world. Ethan, you get the last word. Who's, who's blowing your mind? Well, as I have the last word, the answer is really obvious to me, which is that I'm going to leave this uh, Zoom call incredibly inspired. Listening to all of you talk about your work uh, is kind of thrilling. Some of you's work I I've known for a long time. I mean, Anthony, I remember going to see you a play years ago. I watching you take off in, in this show is so thrilling. Um, but I, I just love listening to the way you guys talk about your work. Um, it, I have to shoot tomorrow. I'm, I'm in Budapest right now, so I'm, the sun's going down as we're Zooming, and I got a 6 a.m. call, and you're kind of inspiring me to put a little bit more thought into tomorrow. <laughs> like, uh, I, just, I, I really like the way you all approach what you do. And it's inspiring. You're, you're inspiring. Thank you so much for participating in this panel, being on Zoom yet again. Congratulations on all your shows. Uh, the, the acclaim has been well earned. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Spectrum News 1, LA Times, The Envelope Roundtable was brought to you by the Apple TV Plus drama series, The Mosquito Coast, for your Emmy consideration in all eligible categories.